On this Sunday before the Epiphany of our Lord, we read the traditional passage for that day. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, the second chapter, verses 1 through 12. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there, ahead of them, went the star they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ministers learn early on how to make adjustments and plans based on practical considerations. For example, I figured out early on in my ministry that when you're planning a worship service, if you have people stand for a prayer, you would better plan that whatever comes next will occur while they're seated. Because as soon as you say amen, whether you want them to or not, people just naturally sit down. There's no theological reason for it, but they do it, and so you plan accordingly. Another example of having to make a practical consideration has to do with the planning around Christmas. I have found that including both the story of the birth of Jesus and the visit of the wise men to the Holy Family, both on Christmas Eve, is a bad idea. Uh, it seems that adding the portion of Scripture from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 to Luke 2, 1 through 20, exceeds the attention span of most young children especially the squirming infant that I usually hold on my laps, lap in a traditional service. And if we were to have the service this year outdoors, as we were not able to do, I would have simply told the story of the visit of the angels and the holy couple going to, to Bethlehem and then leave it at the nativity scene. And that's not just for the children, because there is plenty that's going on there. By the time you have talked about the angelic visitations and the messages and the journey to Bethlehem and the finding of no room in the inn and the birth of the child and the visitation of the shepherds, that's enough for one night. It's a beautiful picture of God's love for all of humanity coming in the form of a baby. And so on that night, we focus on that issue. But the church, through the years, has figured out a way to separate the stories just a little bit. On January the 6th, we celebrate what is known as the Epiphany of our Lord. It's on that day that we read the scriptures about the visitation of the wise men to Bethlehem sometime after the birth. And we're using that today because this is the Sunday before January 6th, before the time when we recognize the coming of the wise men to the uh, Christ child. When we are able to meet in our church sanctuary, you may remember that as we set up the nativity scene, we have all the uh, characters in the Christmas story placed on the communion table until January 6th when the wise men, who you can see up in the very corner of the sanctuary in the choir loft, then they are brought down to the communion table too. It's our way of recognizing the separation between the two events. And we call that epiphany. Now, according to the dictionary, epiphany has at least two meanings. If it has a uh, capital E, then it is the epiphany in our text today. It is specifically the story of the wise men coming to see the Christ child. And it is called an epiphany because not only are they bowing before the Messiah, 
But it's also a recognition that this was just not something for the Jewish people. It is for Gentiles, for everyone else as well. That was an opening in the minds of people. And so it is known as the Epiphany. And then from that, we derive the smaller letter E, Epiphany, which is simply an insight into something new, a new revelation. Uh, for a lot of people, it's come to mean anything that they see new, like a, a young woman who has an epiphany, she says, and realizes she's supposed to break up with her boyfriend. But for those of us who are Christians, it has a specific meaning. It's not just about our text for the day, but it's about some time when we receive a new insight into our relationship with God or the way God wants us to deal with other human beings. It is a recognition that while what we have been doing may have been okay up to this point, there is more insight to be gained. And if that's true, then this epiphany of the wise men is an excellent place for us to start because at, on a superficial level, it's pretty obvious what the epiphany is. It is that all are to bow and to give gifts. Since they gave precious gifts, we are to do the same thing. And since they come from a far distance and are not of the people of Israel, it is also that epiphany that the gospel is for everyone, not just for those who think they have an inside track on what it means to follow God. However, I think if you look at the details of the story, you will find that there is a good bit more to it, that our epiphanies uh, occur in many different ways and involve a whole lot more than our simply thinking, well, now there's something new for us to learn. For example, look at these astrologers, these magi that we call wise men. It is obvious that they studied. Now, because they were astrologers, they studied the stars. So that might not have been the best place for them to begin. But the point is not so much what they were studying as the fact that they were willing to do so. As I said in last week's sermon, so often we close our minds and think we have already learned everything we need to know. And so we stop studying for those of us who are Christians who think we do know it all, we tend to look down our noses at people whom we call agnostics. But the word agnostic literally means, I don't know. And give me a curious agnostic any day over a self-confident Christian, because when I talk to someone who says they don't know something, then there is every possibility that we can have a dialogue with one another. But when someone's mind is completely made up and they're unwilling to study new ideas, then there's not much we can do. It's not very productive to have a conversation. So, first of all, these were men who studied, but you will notice they did not keep their heads in books all the time. Instead, they were keen observers of the world around them. I don't think it's too much of a stretch of an interpretation of this passage to say if they'd always kept their heads in their charts, they never would have looked up. And if they hadn't looked up, they never would have seen the star. And it was the star that led them to Jesus. You and I sometimes can get so involved in what I would call book learning and the academics of it and keeping our heads down that we fail to look around us and observe the world that is part of what God is all about. It's very difficult for us to do that these days, isn't it? Our world has become so confined, the circle of our influence and experience is so much less. But even when we're able to move around, sometimes we only want to have the same experiences over and over again we only deal with the same people over and over again, and we are not often aware of the problems and the challenges and the stresses of other people's lives. It's fine to study about those, but it's also important for us to open our eyes and look around and see the things that are going on around us. Often when we do that, there'll be plenty of epiphanies in our lives too. And then not only did they make an observation, but once they had made it, they sought confirmation it wasn't enough to say, well, I see that star. I bet it leads somewhere. They went on a journey. They looked for confirmation of what they were wanting to know. For us, I see too often people who are shaky in their faith. They're afraid to have it tested by a, dog with, a, dog, a dialogue with anyone who is not already a Christian or someone of another faith or someone of no faith at all. Whenever we hesitate to enter into those, it doesn't say so much about the strength of another person's argument as it does about the weakness of our own faith. We are called to be people of confidence, but not confidence in ourselves, but confidence in the ability of God to work in us and to keep us on the right path as long as we're willing to do that. And that may take us to places where it's difficult and challenging for us. But it is in that time and in those places that we find the most confirmation of what we believe. Our faith is strengthened by its testing. 
And so the wise men sought confirmation. They followed the star. We call them wise men because they were willing to confirm rather than simply to accept. But we call them wise men. And I'm not sure that they were all men. There's one indication that there must have been at least one woman involved in that group because they stopped and asked for directions, which is not something that is characteristic of the male gender. It's also not something that we as Christians do a lot of times. Somewhere along the way, we got the idea that if we are Christians, that by a certain point we ought to know it all, and so therefore we are embarrassed to ask questions. We would never accept that from our children. We expect them to ask all kinds of questions of us, so why should we think that we're any different? It's important for us to recognize that there's still some things that we can learn as Christians, and that is most often found in our going to God, which is precisely what these wise men did. They went on a journey of discovery, and when they came to the place where the child lay, they knelt before him and then offered him in gratitude, the best that they had to offer. You're aware of the traditional interpretation, I'm sure, of the gifts that they brought before him, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gold, traditionally, is a symbol of royalty, and they were kneeling before Jesus as the king to whom they acknowledged their allegiance. Frankincense is what was used in worship to symbolize the prayers of the people going up to God. So that could represent their recognition that this is no ordinary human being but the divine is also in this child. It can also mean that he is the great high priest, as we learn about in Hebrews, who stands between humanity and God and relates the two to one another. And then the myrrh is uh, uh, an aromatic spice that is used in embalming. It reminds us that Jesus came to die. Those are great interpretations. It may have been exactly what was meant by those gifts, but I doubt very seriously that when the men or men and women planned their journey to Bethlehem, they thought specifically about those gifts as representing those things because they didn't know exactly what they would find. They simply brought the best that they had and they laid it before Jesus, which is what we do. This is at the heart of this passage, of course. It is a reminder that our epiphanies often come in worship. That is, when we gather together with the people of God and the Spirit of Christ is among us and we have all the symbols and the reading and proclamation of the Word, when we hear the music, those can often bring in epiphanies, insights into how we are to relate to God. So it's important that as much as we possibly can, we engage in worship. But you'll notice that the wise men did not continue to kneel there. Instead, they went up, they got up, and they went home. They returned to their own country, which is what we figuratively and literally do every time we get up from worship and go home. We return to our ordinary lives, and it is easy for us to think, well, now we have done our religious work. It would have been nice if we had an epiphany there, but now we are back in the real world. When in fact, our epiphanies often come to us in the midst of the real world. It is when we are doing other things that God speaks to our lives and brings insights to us. And that's what all of us are looking for in our lives, isn't it? whether it is in worship or whether it is in our daily lives, we want to relate more closely to God. I see plenty of people who want to grow in their spiritual relationship. Many of you, uh, it strikes me about you, that you are earnestly seeking to know God's will for your life. But you may have looked at some of the, the contemporary spiritual books, and it seems to me that the attitude that most of them have is that it has to do with attitude, that you just open yourself up and God will speak to you. But surely there is more to it than that. Surely there is an example in these magi that we can follow with our lives. It is important for us to study by beginning with the Holy Scriptures, of course. That's the best starting place. But sometimes, like the Ethiopian eunuch, we need to have someone to explain them to us. And so prayer groups and Bible study groups and devotionals and commentaries are all part of the things that lead us to the point where we can know more about what it means to be a follower of God. And in that, we can get insight we can get epiphanies. It's also important for us not to sleepwalk through our world, to notice the world around us, and to see where God might be speaking to us through the voices of others or through the things that we see in the natural world and the people around us. Our epiphanies can often come from being keen observers of the world around us. And then I think it's important for us from time to time to ask for directions. There are plenty of people, uh, ministers and teachers and mature Christians, who are quite willing to share whatever insights we might have or to discuss those issues with you. 
not because we necessarily have all the answers ourselves, but because we too are seeking. And whenever we have a question, we have people to whom we go to. And so we hope that you will do the same thing. I don't know the emotions that those magi were feeling when they got to Bethlehem and knelt before Jesus. Luke does, or excuse me, Matthew doesn't tell us about that. But surely there was some sense of excitement involved in recognizing they have found the one who is the full revelation of God on earth. I wonder, however, if they would have been as excited about it if when they had studied the stars, they recognized, well, he's just right around the corner from where we already are. Sometimes the journey is very exciting for us. Sometimes it is extremely exciting and challenging for us to be in a new place. And I hope that's where you find yourself today, on the threshold of a new year, not knowing what it will hold, but hoping that God will continue to provide insight for your life. For 10 months now, you have gone through the challenge and the stress of continuing to worship even though we couldn't just drop into church on Sunday morning. Since you've done that, it clearly indicates that you're still wanting to know more about how, how to follow God. And so as we come into this new year and as we anticipate, sometime we pray in the near future of being able to return to the sanctuary and worship there. Let's continue to worship God however we can, and especially as we go out in the world to look for God's insights for us. Those are the kinds of epiphanies that I wish for you in the year to come. When the wise men came to Jesus, they, of course, offered him gifts. But the greatest gift of all was the one that was given to the world by Christ when he offered himself. And on the night on which he was betrayed, he made that gift very clear to his disciples. And so I remind us that what has been passed on to me has been passed on from generation to generation from the time of the Apostle Paul, who said that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he had blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. All of you, eat of it. And in the same way also, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had blessed it, he said, this cup represents the covenant of my blood. I tell you, I will not drink it again until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of heaven, all of you drink of it. And it is possible that on that night, or surely sometime after that, each one of those disciples had an epiphany. It was that Christ died for them and was calling them into his service. That's the epiphany that all of us need to have. And I pray that that is renewed for us, even today. Let us pray. For your gift of life and of eternal life, we are grateful to you, O Lord. We thank you that others in the past have sought insights into what it meant to follow you. But now it's up to us. If your light is to be shared in the world, it will be through your disciples on earth. And so we need new insights into where to go and what to do and to whom we must relate in love. So even now, in the quietness of this moment, O oh Lord, we pray that we'll open our lives up to your leading and that we'll receive the epiphanies that we need for the living of our days as the power of Christ is at work in us. In his name we pray. Amen.